various um, groups and uh, well, a geometric interpretation of uh, their definitions. And uh, I guess I have been moving slower than I thought. So what I want to do uh, first today is actually state some um, results and then uh, in, uh, afterwards uh, look at some uh, ways of getting at some of the uh, studying some of these uh, spaces that we have and uh, using some relatively simple arguments to uh, get at uh, some new results. Um, okay, so uh, let me make a table of uh, things. Um, So we looked at various uh, groups, uh, so uh, let me call it GN. Um, um, so in particular, we looked at the uh, break groups, we looked at the symmetric groups, uh, the mapping class groups of an orientable surface of genus G with one boundary component. Similarly, the mapping class group of a non-orientable surface of genus G and a boundary component. And also at the um, automorphism group of a free group of n generates. So. And for each of these, we already said, well, actually, uh, you know, the cohomology of the groups is, of course, the same as the cohomology of the uh, classifying spaces. And uh, we have, for these groups, a sort of multiplication. So the break groups, you can put uh, two breaks next to each other. The symmetric group, you know, has a, um, a permutation on n and the um, points and the permutation on n points gives you a permutation of n plus 1 points. Here was the pairs of pants construction and similar here. And of course, if I have an automorphism of free group on n letters and one on n letters, I get one on n plus n letters. So um, we can therefore form what I would call the group completion. So these, the disjoint union that's what we looked at last time. The disk union of these uh, groups GN form really a monoid. And for any monoid, certainly if you think of a discrete monoid, there is a universal group associated to it, the Gurdenic group. And uh, so G of this monoid. And there's a particular way of uh, constructing this uh, Gurdenic group. Um, topologically, in a topological setting, and that functor G just is, um, well, there's another classifying space, a monoid has a classifying space, and I take omega on it. So let me write down what it is omega. Uh, when I write omega, I just mean the functor, so omega on the space X, is just the functor that takes uh, maps pointed maps, fix a base point in S1, and fix a base point in your space you're mapping to, the maps are supposed to take base point to base point, and I'm just looking at all maps from S1 into my space. So all loops in, uh, in my space that start and end at the same point. So, <laughs> just as the fundamental group is a, a group, this uh, loop space is really a group up to homotopy. Uh, that's an important point because if I have like here my space X, uh, here's my base point, a loop here, uh, one loop and another loop, of course I can just uh, compose these two and to get a new loop. It's not associative, but it's associative of homotopy, and so that's good enough uh, for homotopy. So really, 
when I talk about uh, the group completion of these uh, big monoids that I uh, get from uh, families of groups like this, I can make them into a group by associating a new space, namely I pick classifying space of this monoid and then a new space on that. Right. So uh, the point is um, that I can identify these uh, Gordon deconstructions in all of these cases uh, very well. Actually, uh, maybe I should say something more. So there's a group, um, the group completion there. So I need a certain condition, namely, um, let's assume that uh, if I look at pi naught of my monoid, pi naught of my monoid M, let's assume this is in the center, contained in the center, of um, one H star. What does this mean? Well, the, uh, since I have multiplication on M, that gives me a multiplication on the homology. And of course, the uh, um, connected components of M give me different elements. So this is actually a subset of H0 of M. And I want this to be in the center of my homology. So in other words, when I um, multiply by um, the base point and connect the component on the left or on the right, should not matter here. Now, that is actually, um, so for example, if, uh, of course, my monoid is homotopy commutative, then that always will be the case. Let's assume this. Then, we have that the homology of the group completion of my monoid is actually just uh, the um, localization. So it can take the limit of the homology of N and then tensor Z I naught. Here I have the group make pi naught into a group or in other words, the better way of stating this really is that the, um, if I take the, uh, in our cases we always have uh, pi naught pi naught in our cases are is always equal to the natural numbers, namely one factor for every n. Then I can look at the limit of my um, uh, points. So in our case, this pi, this is pi naught of the distribution of the two g's, the n's. Then I can look at the limit of p g n. and take its homology, or the homology of those, then this is always going to be actually equal to the homology of <coughs> one of the connected components of my homology. Or in other words, this is going to be the homology of um, omega And, well, in all of our cases here, we can actually therefore identify the group completion 
so in our cases, this means actually that the group completion omega B on BGN is going to be equal to, uh, well, there's a factor Z, of course, which is the group completion on the connected components, uh, the natural numbers turn into Z, and then I have B of the infinite group associated to my finite one. So in case of sigma n, this will be, for example, just the infinite symmetric groups. Uh, this will be sort of the mapping class group for infinite genus surface. And then I have something on the topic. Theoretically, we put a plus here, which just means uh, the denotes Gulen's plus construction. Uh, and the point here is that I have to add something, right? This group here, as for example, look in the symmetric group, is not going to be um, a B, and the fundamental group is not going to be a B. It's going to be sigma infinity. However, any loop space, which this one will be, of course, by um, will have a billion fundamental group. So really the plus here is killing all the commutators. Right? So um, x plus is called plus construction. Where I kill kill all the commutators in my one of x. How do I kill an, an element in the fundamental group? I just associate um, a new on a, a two cell. And well, that's not quite enough because what I want is that this space here, of course, still has the same homology. That's what this statement says. So that means I kill all these by doing on on this two cells, and then I do on uh, also three cells because I don't want to create any new homology in dimension two and uh, three. So I do on three cells. And you might think, well, since I don't want to uh, change the homology, I have to go on. But in general, I don't have to go on. Um, this is it, as long as the fundamental group here is actually perfect, which it, um, sorry, the commutator subgroup of the fundamental group is perfect, which is in all of these cases. So really, uh, think of this first construction as gluing on two sets and three sets. The whole point being is that this uh, space here still has the same homology as the space without the plus. omega b construction, then of course I get here something that is of the form b e omega infinity plus filling all the commutator subgroup. But the, uh, here I can write it, I can identify, we can identify these spaces, and that's something that is uh, important. This actually becomes just omega 2 s2. So omega 2 s2 is uh, just applying the loop space functor I have there twice. So this is max really from a two sphere where it's a base point in itself. So it's a double loop space. I'll say it a little bit more later on. So if I do the same thing for the symmetric group, I kill the, fundament, uh, the commutator subgroup of sigma infinity. And in this case, instead of getting the double loop space, I get 
an infinite loop space. So really, uh, what is this? Well, I certainly can replace here uh, omega n, Sn, and here Sn, Sn. And I now let n go to infinity. And this is, this is a limit space of that. Very important later on. Um, but what is a space really if we think about it rationally? Rationally, what, what is a map from Sn to Sn? Well, uh, on the n homology, it's completely given by its degree. The degree of a map uh, is just what it induces in the uh, nth homology, and that is just the natural um, number. So the degree here gives you a map into Z. If you, if you now look at this map uh, Z, that actually turns out to be uh, a rational equivalent. So really, uh, you want to think of these uh, higher loop spaces of Sn to Sn as a blown up version of Z. That's how it here. Now there's complicated stuff up here, but uh, rationally, it's all given by Z. Okay, so similar here, I won't write out to each time this part, um, what we have here, it turns out we have another infinite loop space, so that's what this uh, is telling us, and what I'm going to write here, I'm going to uh, explain later on, so T, S, O, 2. Again, here we have an infinite loop space called M, T, O, 2. And for f out fn, we actually get a very simple one again, namely it is the same as getting from this method. <coughs> so we know that these have the homology of these infinite guys. So if we understand the homology here, one would hope we understand some of the homology here. So that's the idea, but somehow these infinite loop spaces have a lot of uh, structure, we know a lot about them, so that we can understand the problem here. But, of course, uh, this here doesn't tell us exactly how we go from the homology of the infinite guy, G infinity, to the homology of a finite one. And I mentioned this yesterday as well. For each of these, you really need um, some sort of statement that tells you that the homology is stable. So, um, I think I introduced the function phi n last time. That told me that uh, whenever the degree of the homology is less or equal to phi n, I get an isomorphism from homology of Gn to homology of Gn plus 1. Okay. Last time. So last time we said that the homology of Gn, I had the magnitude is the homology of Gn plus 1 or if you like, of spaces so like this. And uh, this is going to be a, uh, supposed to be an isomorphism if star was less than equal to a function uh, phi n. And the idea was that phi n should go, uh, go to infinity with n, and so that way we would, of course, get some information on each of these finite uh, gn's from the uh, limit case. And all our groups have actually homology stability. Uh, so 
this is a very classical case, maybe we have here uh, that phi n is just simply n over 2. This goes back to uh, Nakaoka and Arnold, and similar with sigma n. Uh, the homology stability of the mapping class group is another very uh, classical theorem. Uh, first proved by Hera, and uh, improved by Ivanov, and uh, under Williams and Bolton, and so on. So here the best limit at the moment we have is actually uh, 2g <coughs> minus 2 <coughs> 3. For the non-orientable mapping class group, that's a uh, theorem by um, Natalie Bart, so uh, again, improved range uh, by Bolton and uh, Andrew Williams of G over 3. Um, the automorphism of Fn we have actually simply N over 2. And that's a theorem by uh, Hedger and Fuchmann. So, uh, really, this allows us, will allow us uh, then to uh, conclude so from the homology of these spaces to the homology of the uh, one step. So, in some sense, uh, looking at this table, there are sort of two phases, namely, the first two cases are really quite classical. And then the next phase, you might say, well, this has been done, I don't know, uh, in the 80s and uh, nine, well, 90s and uh, early 2000s. But uh, there's yet an, uh, another one, another phase in some sense in the last five years. Uh, these theorems, people were able to improve them now considering the amorphous groups. So um, let me just write those new uh, colors. So I want to introduce something, and well, first I want to remind you, what was G1? This was high naught of the diffeomorphism group oriented of a uh, surface of genus G. So let me write the surface of genus G as a torus, as one plus this one, and then connected sum G times. And because I have a one boundary component, I should really take out uh, a disk. And the boundary was supposed to be fixed. Okay. And remember, there was actually, there's a canonical map from the diffeomorphism group to the mapping class group, which just sends an element to its connected component. And that was actually. Uh, homotopy equivalence because the connected components here are contractible as soon as the uh, surface has um, negative Euler properties. So really, the mapping class group here catch all of the homotopy group of the different morphisms. So when one wants to now think about this in higher dimensions, one really will want to work on the different morphism level. So really, one can now consider, right now, let's define WG <coughs> of so the manifold of dimension 2G to be a connected sum of SD cross SD. So this is the higher dimensional analog of a torus, I take a G connected sum of these and again I take out one disk. One now this is going to be of dimension 2G of course, 2D. Well that's a manifold one might like to consider. And uh, you can consider the um, Diffeomorphism of this manifold 
which fixes the boundary point-wise and uh, orientation preserving. So that's a cool biological And it's actually uh, a, quite a tour de force to show that, well, two things. On the one hand, we have the analog of these theorems, which I haven't explained, but I, let me just write it down. This is going to be something, again, an infinite loop space, MTSO, um, and the 2D is, SO2D just means we are coming from an orientable manifolds of dimension 2D, and the MT just says it's related to actually the globalism uh, uh, spectrum. But um, here, I let me just finish this. I need to take a certain connected connections. At the moment, this is just notation. It's just some infinite loop space, which we sort of understand. Okay. And at the same time, in order to have this in, in, of interest and be able to, of course, um, get some idea of the homology here, of the characteristic classes of WG bundles, we have here the corresponding here in homology stability. And um, this is going to be G minus 3 over. Yeah. So you're saying, first of all, that, that stability is independent of D. So it is. The, the stability that you just put out, yeah. it depends, it's independent of D. Uh, yep. But I should have actually said something. Namely, I need to say here that uh, <coughs> D is greater or equal to 3. So this is okay. not actually covering this case. Sure. But if I fix G and allow D to, does it stay? Does that, stay, does that stabilize? Uh, the homology doesn't stabilize, no. Okay. Sorry. So I have to fix <laughs> so, to, uh, uh, I have to, to fix D. Sorry, I'm fixing the D here. Yeah. Otherwise I don't get so, yeah. so this D is fixed and then the stability range is independent of D, but of course it corresponds to but if I ignore the grading, does it stabilize? Uh, what grading? That if I ignore the homology grading, so an isomorphic cohomology modular grading as I allow D to increase, um, and fixing G. Um, fixing G. I'm not sure. Sure what we are. Um, so I mean, uh, here <coughs> the g uh, is equal to the n, and uh, here I want to go, of course, into the different morphisms of uh, w g plus one by gluing in another negative component. Don't have maps when you vary dimension. There are no comparison maps. So you have a maps in. So this is this thing on varying the dimension. Yeah. How to define geometric no, stability? Yeah. When you vary the dimension, there's no natural map. Yeah. But there is a combinatorial. There's a combinatorial uh, element to those that if you're more I mean, these are these connected sums are combinatorial have a combinatorial component. So there's that combinatorial part, and then of course, the, the, as you vary d, the cop is going to grade, But I'm saying ungraded. Does it does it uh, stabilize in an ungraded way? We just want to be very understand. Speak about Betty now, or something? Yeah, the that's numbers. right. Yeah. No, I mean it, it's not going to be stable. Uh, fixing the homology, fixing a homology degree, it's not going to be stable. It's just going to increase. You get more and more classes. The same way, actually, maybe that, that would be. I mean, these SO. Things come uh, don't come in for. Uh, I mean, they're here for a reason. Then the homology of these are going to be relative. Uh, the homology of these guys are going to be 
uh, closely related to BSO 2D. And so as D uh, grows, you get more and more classes. If I may just insist for a second, I mean, some of these connected sums of spheres are given combinat by combinatorial recipes. And so when I come to look at this, the diffeomorphisms, the space of diffeomorphisms, do you, do you have some idea of how large a contribution comes from just the combinatorics of the situation? what you mean by combinatorial Well, I, I mean, if I take an n-gon or something, I can construct, uh, by, by topological means, I can construct spaces which are connected sums of sphere products. Sure. And so they're given by a combinatorial recipe, like a simplicial complex. So the automorphism group of the, of the simplicial complex, that generates some of the, the diffeomorphisms on these connect sums of sphere products. And, and my question is, uh, do we have, is, is there a good way to separate those out uh, in your I theory? I don't really know. Uh, there's nothing that I, I'm aware of how to connect. Um, uh, I mean, if you have a combinatorial way of giving something, then you also have to ask whether it's, it's going to give you a smooth right? Yeah, because it depends on the smoothing of yeah, the yeah. So I, I, I don't really know. Maybe something. Oh, okay. <coughs> so this tells us somehow that the sort of methods can be uh, generalized uh, to also cover different morphism of uh, manifolds. Um, and most recently, so uh, I haven't put down any names here. Uh, this is uh, a theorem by but I do have a more Galapsus and Randall Williams. And then uh, most recently, there's another uh, sort of uh, departure here, namely, if we can't look at the mapping class group as being equivalent to this, there's another thing you can do. Namely, you can look at uh, a diffeomorphism group and D, any um, topological group, and you can think of it with a discrete topology. So this is something that uh, Milner certainly considered for a uh, compact Lie group, and he asked the question, are the, is a homology of uh, a compact Lie group with its discrete topology, right? And Milner asked the question, how close are these two things related? And there's a conjecture that uh, periodically they're always the same. Now here, we are looking at a rather larger group, namely the diffeomorphism group of this manifold, and look at it <coughs> discreetly. And again, a similar thing, we understand somehow the infinite term, and we have uh, homology stability, namely, uh, student of Galaxias uh, proves, Nariman, uh, that uh, here we have st homology stability with this rather large discrete group, and again, he is And then he again associates to the infinite of the group completion with again an infinite loop space, and this time I, well, I just write it like this. Um, at the moment, the point is it's an infinite loop space, so it has lots of structure. And uh, the other point is that, uh, let me just say that this will be related, not maybe surprisingly, to having a spoliation space, okay? So, in order to, I should really put down at least some of the main names here, uh, to be fair. So, uh, this case is, um, I think I should have Dr. Cohen's name, an R mode uh, for the homology stability. This theorem is very famous in uh, um, homotopy theory, namely, this is the uh, so called Barrett, Pretty, and Cohen theorem. 
anti-homology stability essentially uh, Uh, and from the 70s. And then here we have uh, homology stability for the mapping class group goes back to Cara. And uh, that this is actually um, can be identified with this um, if loop space is a Matsu Weiss theorem. Uh, the second one is. Um, Natalie Carr. <coughs> well, in some sense, she uh, improved the uh, higher stability theorem, and then uh, the Max and Weiss theorem goes through. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, Bookman. And uh, well, that actually the infinite term in this case is also just omega infinity s infinity uh, so then by Galassius. And here we have Galassius and Van der William. And for the bottom one, it's narrow one. So before I really uh, say more about this <coughs> And uh, if time uh, permits, I hope to come back to some of this uh, explanation. What I want to s do now first is actually show that these extra structures that we have are helpful, that we can get some definite results. They're not going to be the most exciting results, but they're um, simple things that we can do. So uh, how do we... Uh, work with these infinite loop space structures. Well, most of the times things are not given immediately to us as an infinite loop space. And we need some sort of machinery to detect that something should give us in the end an infinite loop space. And these are operands. So in particular, I want to talk about the so-called surface operands. So what are operands? Um, operands are collections, let's call them DKs of spaces, one for every K. And the idea is that DK should somehow encode for us KRE um, operations. So, for us, generally, KRE multiplications. Okay. So, the surface of what I'm thinking of is you take, uh, well, the simplest one, you take a surface of genus zero, so really a disk, and then I have K legs sticking. So K holes in my disk. In order for this to somehow encode um, multiplications, I need certain um, composition bars. So I want a DK cross D and 1 cross D and K thinking of this first one acting on the next ones, that should be a nice map to N1 plus And of course, in, when I have these surfaces, um, I can 
just glue in more surfaces like this. Here I have n one of them, and here n k. And what I get, of course, is now again another surface of GS0 with n plus n one plus plus uh, n k uh, different poles. So this gluing in this case gives me uh, what we call the structure map of the operand. And that has to satisfy certain uh, associativity conditions and uh, unit conditions, but that's basically what's happening here. So there are certain properties. Um, what is important for us is that each of the space dk comes actually with a sigma k action. Namely, I can commute these legs. And while I commute the legs, I can also commute the factors here. So if I commute the labels of certain legs, then I commute the factors, and this composition is actually equivalent with the spectrum. So to be precise, I'm going to take dk to be the uh, classifying space of gamma 0 and plus 1. OK, so uh, these operations are supposed to operate on something. And uh, a D algebra is now a space X, which comes with an action of this operand. So uh, I want it to have uh, DK cross X to the K. I want structure X like this. Of, um, And again, of course, this is supposed to be set with that. The best thing to think uh, is maybe to look at an example. So let's think of an example. I take uh, x to be, say, the um, disjunct union of my break groups. Now remember, that, of course, I can just think of um, the mapping class group of a genus zero surface with n points. So now it's clear how I want this to operate. Namely, if I have one of my surfaces in the operat, from dk, and I have uh, something in my break group, so that corresponds to having something in the mapping class group of the disk with uh, um, points in it, then of course what I get is, doing this, is just another disk with more points marked in it. And so this way, I get a map from uh, being the mapping class to genus zero of k boundary components with the uh, break group of n one points, uh, break group and k points into the break group n one. Excuse me. Yeah. Could you just say? I just missed how the break group is entering here. Can I just? Um, I'm just uh, trying to make the break group or B of the break groups into an algebra over this particular operand. Right. But in, the, in the actual construction. In the construction, okay. I think of the break group as the mapping class group of a disk with my. So that's gamma zero and 
comma yeah, one. Yeah, so the up means a point rather than. But there should be also comma one, right? It's a distance of the sphere. Sorry, you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a disk and I take mark points in it. And so uh, when I glue the underlying surfaces, it's the same story as before. Yeah, every different morphism here gives me a mapping class, of course. Um, I can extend it to a different morphism of, of the whole thing by gluing in whatever different morphism I have here because the uh, all of my different morphisms keep the boundary fixed, so I can always uh, glue different morphisms together like that. And therefore, the mapping class Okay. So it's really it's just this picture that gives me this um, operation. And similarly, let me just write it down here as so another example. I can do the same thing when I take um, S. So this is a disjoint union of the mapping class groups associated with surfaces of genus G and one boundary component. So in that case, of course, given one of these surfaces in my operat here, from my operat, given a different morphism here and a different morphism for something genus 1 and genus Okay, I now get something of uh, a different morphism of the uh, uh, surface of genus G1 plus etc. GK. So really, S is also um, an algebra over this opera. might say, well, I haven't done that much more than just say that I have multiplication, which I did really last time anyway. But I now have a little bit more, namely, in my uh, DK, it's not just a point, I have <coughs> the whole space, then this is uh, uh, B gamma O. The space of all, um, well, the classifying space of this mapping class group. So, in particular, in my mapping class group, I can twist and I can swap legs around. And what I see is actually that uh, being an, an algebra over the upper rod, where I have all these extra um, homotopies, really, tells me immediately that the um, multiplication that I get is actually homotopy commutative. So a little bit more is true actually. So that's there. If X is a D algebra, then it's group completion. is a W space. So, in other words, I can write this as omega 2 maps from a sphere into some other space. And I want to specify what it is. So in particular, you know, just like uh, multiplication in um, the pi 2, with this um, second homotopy groups, is commutative, multiplication on uh, dark loop spaces will be homotopy commutative because uh, the usual sort of trend, uh, um, picture. If I have multiplication of two things in here, then I can move them around by a movie. And I get 
um, so, more topic of product. So, this, the D algebra structure, if I might just ask you a technical question, how, how does that interact with the dialectal uh, algebra structure that you have built in here? Well, it is the same. I mean, it, the, this looks like the little cubes, right? That's right. Yes. It is. That's it. I, I it is. So. Yeah. So, uh, I, I haven't said this, the D algebra structure is just actually a tiny bit more. Instead of uh, it's a, it's coming from the brains, it's a, it's the ribbon brains. But um, um, in particular, we have this. So, dialectal brain is exactly what you need. Okay. So, as an example, What we have, uh, we uh, had our example up here. The first one was given by the type group. Um, so I can put in my uh, break groups here, B, N. And indeed, this theorem now tells us that this is a double loop space. And indeed, it, its classical theorem is just uh, double loops on S2. Now I want to say a little bit more. This is a very particular uh, double loop space. Um, okay, so let's just think about this a bit. <coughs> I have a hop vibration. Like this. S1 going to S3. Uh, so these are the unit quaternions. unions. And uh, I have a, a S1, V1 acting on it, and this is just a quotient space. Now, given a vibration, I can always induce another vibration by looping everything. And indeed, I can extend the vibration on this side by putting more loops. So S2. And again, these three terms will be a vibration. But the loops, so the maps from S1 to S1, are actually up to homotopy just set, given by the degree. So what we get here is that from this global calculation, we see that actually um, the double loop space on S2 is just the same as the double loop space on S3 cross Z. Now I could talk a little bit about this. Thanks. Okay, so what? Omega to S3, I can write it a little bit differently. Okay, omega to S2 on S1. Meaning, okay, this is just notation. Uh, when we have in general omega and Sn on X, that's just uh, means that I have omega N on the suspension of X. And the suspension, uh, double suspension of S1 is of course just S3, so that's just notation. But the way writing it like this is um, the point here is that this, or this case, is a free omega n space. Okay? When I have omega n, S n on something, this is a free omega n space on X. Now it's not just a standard theorem in homotopic here. What does it mean, however? It's important. Uh, the thing is that unraveling this, if I have a map from X into any other n space, we put 
y. So I take any map here, f, then being a free and for loop space just means I have the following universal property, namely I have the canonical map from X into this, and then there exists a unique atomotopy, of course, extension. And it's unique in the sense that this is a map of omega n spaces. So, in other words, this map here, being an omega n uh, map, means it's actually induced from S, uh, S n smash x to y. And then I just uh, get the induced map on the z uh, and go to space. So, effectively, just adjointing. Um, so this is the, coming from the atom. And uh, the point is that this, what is an n for um, loop map? It's uh, you know, if I have a map from maps uh, S n to uh, X to Y. So here I have a S n smash X. Yeah. And I want this to go into maps from S n into uh, some y. Well, clearly, if I have a map just from here to here, then I get a map like that. And that's the point. And if it is compatible, then it is Structure coming from here. 
namely, I have a, a, a one-dimensional class from D2. This is just um, actually V of Z1, so I have a one-dimensional class, uh, E1, and I take uh, X tensor X on this side. And that's a so-called dialectic operation of X. Okay. Important thing is here to remember is that really everything is generated by the homology of uh, Y over here. Actually, mod, mod 2 it should be called a Kudawaraki operation. And if Bill Browder would die, I feel like I'm just saying that. Yeah, no, that's right. Okay. Okay, so I want to come to my first uh, simple application of this whole thing. I have set up this uh, machinery to just do a very simple application. So last time we looked at various maps between these uh, groups. And so we need to remember this theorem here. But, um, Is homotopic the same as the double loop space or the free 
a double loop space on S1. Right? That's what we discussed up there. It's not yeah. And uh, of course, this maps into um, the gamma plus infinity. Now, last time we discussed actually uh, the first homology of these groups. They were just the abelianization. So the first homology group of uh, gamma G1 in particular was zero. So that also means that pi 1 of this is going to be zero. <coughs> okay. That's just because, uh, yeah. I'm killing the uh, commutator subgroup, so there's no homology here, um, and there's no homotopy in there. So this now being a free infinite, a free double loop space on S1, means by our characterization by the universal property, this map here is completely determined by what it induces on S1. the map that is uh, on S1. That is as long as I know that this is a double loop space. Map. Okay, let's assume for the moment we know that this is a double loop space map. Then we are done because S1 goes into here. H1 of this is zero, which is the same as pi one is, uh, so pi one is zero. This has to be non-homotopic, and therefore, uh, also, since this is unique after homotopy, therefore, also, this has to be non-homotopic. And hence, we are done. So if this is uh, trivial, then not in particular, it's trivial. In terms of the dialectic of operations, we are more happier with that. So if somehow we said this double loop space is completely determined, the homology is determined by what it does um, on the homology of the underlying space and this um, operation Q. But of course the homology in H1, this map is also going to be zero and therefore since the homology of this whole space is generated by that and these Qs, it's going to be zero as long as the map here in homology uh, commutes with the Q operation, which it does as soon as we know it's a double loop space map. Okay, so why is it a double loop space map? That, of course, is because we want to think of both of these. Uh, we have to show that the multi the action of D2 <coughs> is compatible. So let me just do that. Um, well, I'm going to have a different uh, uh, action on this one, namely uh, I'm going to consider the disjoint union of the gamma G2s, all of those, and I'm having, um, I need to say how I'm going to multiply these now by doing on surfaces. And the way I multiply them is, in this case, by gluing a surface of genus zero <coughs> actually two of them. So this really gives me a map from um, multiplication map now from genus G to cross gamma G dash two into gamma G plus G dash um, and I'm adding at this one. So it's a different multiplication than we thought about at first. And that's why it actually took a while to get, uh, get this thing straight out and simple. Uh, but 
given this multiplication on the space here, this is now compatible with um, the disk operation, D2 operation, and the break groups, and this injection of the break groups. And therefore, the whole film goes through. So therefore, uh, the map now given from B, B um, 2 G plus 2 into this product here, gamma G2, is compatible with this operation. Is a D2 algebra. once you have the setup, because then you just need to understand how the operation um, impact with each other. Okay. So it's tradition to have a break, but um, you, or, or shall I go on and then maybe finish uh, not too late? element is zero, but the group two is the direct generated by direct operation Q and Q two. But if this is the uh, group two map, then the, the direct second operation could be zero. So why group is two? Um, I'm not sure. So, so uh, this is the group two correctly. If it is uh, a D algebra map or a double loop space map, then it means that uh, a Q commutes with the map. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so all the sorry, uh, maybe maybe I just write down the Z two homology of the uh, what is the Z two homology of the Z two homology of the break group is just given by a class um, x1, and then it's q of oh, I'm x1, sorry, I'm sorry. and then ah, it's, it's q pure. squared of x1. I, I, I'm sorry. I, so I, 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 I confused. Uh, look, please. I, I, the q1, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, not q2, right. I confused. Okay. Uh, yes. So, yeah, if this then goes to zero, then uh, all right, the other, right, and right. it commutes. I, I thought it's, uh, there is a q2. It's only q1 is generated, right? Yeah. So, so that's why. So on a homology, you can just think of it in that, those terms. But actually, uh, the whole thing is homotopically trivial. All right, so um, in the next, I don't know, uh, 20 minutes or so, I want to um, look at the other map that we considered. Um, and do something similar there. Okay. So now I want to use the uh, infinite loop space structure actually here and do something similar and consider the map from uh, these mapping class groups into the automorphism of the free group. So let me just remind you. Um, okay. So uh, let's write one of them. I have this uh, representation rho, which went um, from the mapping class group of genus uh, G and 1 boundary component. 
call this word class actually, into the automorphism of a free group, namely the free group of uh, genus 2G. This was just given by looking at uh, the action of a diffeomorphism or mapping class on the fundamental group of the underlying surface. So the underlying surface has, uh, of course, is equal to a bouquet of two Gs uh, as ones, and uh, so we just get a map from the mapping class group into the automorphism of uh, F2G. Can I ask a question? Is this out or out? Um, I, I like to think of out. Sorry, out. My pronunciation is bad. Uh, this one, namely, <laughs> I'm fixing the uh, boundary here. And so I can think of the uh, a base point being fixed. So it's a uh, odd. But the left side is an out. Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, that. Uh, uh, I think you're thinking the about. The uh, boundary is fixed. There's no problem. But I'm fixing a boundary. Okay. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so this is just the uh, representation um, on on what it does on Taiwan. Okay. And similarly, we can do uh, the same for the non-oriented surfaces. And of course, genus G, non-oriented surface of genus G has pi 1 uh, z to z, uh, sorry, pi 1 is f g, g generators. Okay, so looking at these, I, the theorem is that this induces, actually I'm going to state the point down here first, induces a split injection uh, on stable homology. Okay. And I can take here, for emphasis, Z coefficients. Okay. Stable meaning on the infinity groups or in the range. And this one induces a split surjection. Again, on stable homology, uh, but in this case, I have to be consider my away from the prime 2. So I invert the prime 2, so I take coefficients in z1 half. Okay. So let me prove that. And again, it is very similar to what we just did before. So I, this time I want to look at uh, omega infinity, s infinity, and Similar as before, this is really, it's a free infinite loop space on x naught. Now, s naught has two points, namely um, a base point. and a free point. The base point, maps on base points are completely determined and the free point is in the form of So, what's the outline of our, uh, the proof here? Let's uh, consider um, on group completion, so I'm now using the fact that I'm Gamma infinity, oh sorry, gamma G1. I have 
alpha map from here into omega b uh, v out. And I know I'm now using uh, Galaxius uh, sounds uh, theorem that this is omega infinity as so this is okay. So let's assume this is actually a map of infinite loop spaces. So in order then to um, understand this map, or actually I want to construct the splitting, I look what happens to S0, okay? I can map S0 into this thing. Well, remember this is just Z cross a connected component. The base point has to go to the base points, which lives in the zero component. And the free point, I just map it into the one component here and some other point here. But this is connected, so where a point goes in here is uh, not automotive is irrelevant. So I just need to know where these two points go in which I mean in which components they go. That's all I need to know. So the one map I consider here is just okay, the base point has to go to the zero component, but uh, the free point I to send it into the one. And now I follow what this map is over here. So this is after all Z cross B. Um, so again, the composition here is completely determined where the free point goes and indeed what component it goes to. But that's <coughs> easy to see now because um, my map here takes the G component here to the 2G component here. It's doubling, right? Because um, I have here two, it's a free group on 2G, right? So it's basically the Euler characteristic is 2G minus two. So this actually goes into the two component here. So if we know that this is an infinite loop space, uh, Then I know that the, uh, I have a composition here. I can extend it right? by my universal property. I get that all of Q is not going through here. And it's completely determined by where this one point went. And this is the multiplication by two. <coughs> now, if I invert two, then actually this is going to give me or in homology, it means that I have an isomorphism as long as I look away from uh, my two. And of course, the case when I um, <laughs> look at this here, it's even easier because the um, one component goes to the one component here. Uh, so the composition is actually a homology equivalence. And I get a splitting, and it's, uh, in particular, I have a split rejection in state of the So um, there are two hard bits. The really hard bit is, of course, this equivalence. But unfortunately, uh, to prove that this is actually <coughs> omega infinity map uh, at the moment is more complicated than I uh, like to present because it uses 5,000 pages and so it's So I probably shouldn't uh, do that, but maybe uh, just to indicate how one, I mean, it, it bothers me a little bit why it is so difficult. Because what is, uh, I mean, I should tell you a little bit about machinery. For double loop spaces, we have the opera, the surface opera, where we look at genus zero, uh, surfaces. There's another operat, another surface operat, S, where the nth space is actually given by 
the disjoint union of the mapping class groups with n plus one boundary components. So instead of just looking at a genus zero surfaces like such, I now allow myself to have <coughs> any genus surfaces. Now this is another operat, and um, indeed uh, you can uh, find al define algebra out of it. And the theorem in this setting is that if x is an S algebra, the surface is x on it, then somewhat surprisingly maybe. Then actually the group completion of X, so omega B X, is an omega infinity space. So we do actually see infinite loop spaces coming from these surface operands. So uh, one would like to construct actually this map just as a map over this operand. But that seems to be um, more complicated than um, at the moment. I, I don't know exactly how to do it so in the easy way. But uh, we do know this is an infinite loop space map for, for other reasons. So, um, but I would like to do it. And I think I should just stop here.